So this video is to do uh, two things. One, uh, I'm gonna go over the project so you guys have a verbal directions of the project even though I talked about it in class. Uh, and two, I'm gonna go over all the material that I taught in class about the Native American uh, unit, which again, is really only about two days of teaching, but you're gonna have a test-ish thing over this on Friday. So here we go, project. You are going to present on four of these things that are in bold, bold, uh, about your Native American tribe. But you need to research all of these things uh, not just the things that you're presenting on, because that's also going to be points. Basically, if you look at your packet, this front page is, and front and back actually, is where you're going to be writing information. Now you have to research this about your tribe. How do you know your tribe? I circled it on each individual packet for each student that I gave yesterday in class, that was Monday, or today, which is Tuesday. Uh, and you are going to research uh, where they lived. That's the region. So were they in the northeast, like Maine? Uh, were they in the uh, southeast, like the Seminole Indians in Florida? Uh, were they Pueblo, which are going to be like the north, or sorry, the, the southwest, like New Mexico-ish territory? Uh, so you have to tell me where they're at and what's like the climate there. If you just look it up, New Mexico territory, it's going to be dry and hot. And you're going to have, if it's Illinois, if you don't know what Illinois climate is, go look outside. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, so that's the first one. Uh, talk about the history. Uh, basically, I'm looking at how long did they exist? Uh, how long were they a tribe? Uh, what, what, when was their heyday? Um, how big were did they get? Just give me the history of what the tribe was. Uh, it's a pretty big section to write those stuff out. Fill that out in your packet. Uh, number three, the religious practices of the tribe. Many of these tribes are going to have different religious practices. Describe it, uh, what their religion was based around. Uh, next, uh, you are going to do this in class as, as part of the presentation piece, uh, but you are going to uh, teach the class one word in your Native American's language. So you have to look up the language of the Native American tribe, and then you're going to look up a word to teach the rest of the class how to say that word. Good? Uh, then you're going to describe the homes they lived in. Uh, was it adobe? Was it clay? Was it mud? Was it uh, teepees? Tell me what type of, tell your class, uh, or actually tell me with the research, what, what homes they lived in. Uh, next, describe the type of weapons they used. Don't just put bow and arrows. They, they, they had many different types of weapons. Please describe what type of weapons they used. Uh, describe their economy. And this is going to be like what they grew, what they hunted, what they sold, what their economy looked like. The next ones are going to be things you present on. So you're presenting on teaching us how to say one word in the language. You're also going to present on the interactions your tribe had with Europeans and Americans. So if you were the Seminole Native Americans, talk about the Trail of Tears because they were on the Trail of Tears, a Cherokee too. Uh, if you were the um, Dakotas in the Dakotas region, so if you're the Sioux, you're going to talk about uh, what happened with Cusker. And you're going to talk about what happened uh, later on in Wounded Knee. Uh, if, so talk about the interactions with Americans. Another thing you're going to present on is where are they at now? So where are they at physically? Like where, what reservation are they on? If there are a reservation, does your tribe even exist anymore? And if so, what, is, what does it look like? How many are, how many members of that tribe still exist? Where are they located? What's their life like? The next thing you're going to do is describe and demonstrate, demonstrates the key word here, some sort of cultural aspect of their, of their tribe. So it could be a dance could be a war cry, something that's part of their culture, you're going to demonstrate to the class in a small version of it. So that's your presenta presentation piece. There's four things for that. Make sure you do all the research. It's 55 points total. Let's get into the actual uh, lectures that I'm going to do a quick, brief version of them for this video. Is it going to be everything you need? No, because there's some things you're going to need to know from in class, but this will give you a quick version. There's five things we're going to talk about. Indian Removal Act is the first one. So the Indian Re Removal Act was brought to you by a guy named Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, uh, President of the United States, who ran on uh, many different platforms, but one of them was the common man. The common man wanted territory in the South to grow cotton. Why? The cotton gen was just invented, and the Southerners who wanted this land needed to kick off the Native Americans to get this land, because Native Americans had treaties, signed legal documents that showed that they owned the land in the South. And Andrew Jackson, one of his platforms were, I'm going to get you that land. And he was a man of his word. So here's what happens. The Indian Removal Act, uh, in according to Jackson's view, gave him the right to renegotiate treaties or basically 
ignore the treaties that already existed and remove Native Americans from the land of the South. I'm talking about Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, that type of territory. So he starts the process using this to actually remove Native Americans to the West, specifically Oklahoma, which we're going to get to with the Trail of Tears in just a minute. This vote uh, for this Indian Removal Act wins by one single vote. That's it. One vote. Uh, so it was something that wasn't super popular, but it got through. So then we're going to get to the Trail of Tears. Now, the Trail of Tears really hinges on this idea of civilized versus uncivilized and the fact that uh, Native Americans were considered uncivilized based on the criteria, based on the bar that was set for, uh, set by uh, Europeans and soon-to-be Americans. Now, we talked about the unfairness of this because if I consider children, students, your age, uncivilized because you don't use big words like I use, that's an unfair bar to reach. I'm about 20 years older than you guys, and I've gone to college. So to consider you uncivilized because you guys don't use big words like I do is an unfair bar to, to set, and especially since I'm the one setting it, which benefits me. So the idea of being uncivilized as Native Americans because you look at using land differently than Europeans or Americans is unfair because it's a different structure. It's a different cultural belief. But anyway, they're considered uncivilized. And because of they're considered uncivilized, they are going to be removed from the land. So then uh, the uh, Americans can use that land to benefit their own kind. Now, what happens is, is you have about 25 million acres of land that are taken from Native Americans from treaties that they signed, legal documents. Uh, you have uh, their homes are ransacked and basically stuff is stolen after they're kicked out. You have uh, them get on the Trail of Tears, which is basically from the Florida region and Georgia region and that type of region all the way to Oklahoma, about one-fourth of the people on the Trail of Tears die. And when they do die, uh, their families aren't allowed to mourn for days. They, are, they, had to, they keep pushing them to keep going. Uh, and this Trail of Tears lasts, lasts for a few, few decades, actually, the movement of about 100,000 Native Americans. So here's the important thing about the Trail of Tears is the idea of the three pillars of our, of our government, judicial, the executive and the legislative branch. Each branch is supposed to control the powers of the other two. But the problem is Andrew Jackson does this, breaking the contracts and treaties, the legal documents protecting the Native Americans' land, and the Cherokee actually bring this to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court rules in favor of the Native Americans that Andrew Jackson does not have the constitutional right to do this. And Andrew Jackson's reply is, uh, ju uh, Supreme Court Justice John Marshall uh, made his ruling. Uh, see if he can enforce it. Basically, Marshall, you made your ruling, and I don't care. I'll do what I want. So that's what he does. He does what he wants. Uh, and this is a important idea because if you have members in any branch that don't listen to the other branches when they try to check their power, that's when you get to the idea of bad news bears. That's tyranny. That's dictatorship. That's not good. And this is what this was. And anyway, they moved them south, or sorry, west to Oklahoma. And it doesn't stop there. They eventually, we find that there's oil in Oklahoma and those Native Americans who were, their treaties were ignored here. The treaties to put them in Oklahoma are ignored. And they get pushed again uh, further, further west into like Nevada territory. So that's the Trail of Tears. Uh, there's one more moment of Trail of Tears, the Ohio River. You have this situation where the Native Americans are trying to cross the Ohio River. And uh, the ferry people, the people that own the ferries to ferry people across the Ohio River, charge them a dollar to cross while they charge other people that are not Native American 12 cents. So back then, a dollar is more than it is the day. So that right there actually caused some Native Americans to have to set up makeshift camps in the wintertime on the Ohio River, and some froze to death. So there you go. All right, Custer. So Custer's last stand. Custer was in the Civil War, and uh, while he was in the Civil War, actually, let's, let's backtrack just a little bit. So uh, he was originally going to be a teacher. He gets a degree to be a teacher, and he goes, ah, I'm not doing that. So then he goes to West Point, and he gets uh, trained to be a soldier, and he gets a lot of demerits. And uh, demerits are basically like reds for, for their school. And it's for fighting and not following directions, that type of thing, leaving base and stuff like that. And eventually he goes into the war. He has 11 horses that are shot out from underneath him that are die. But he, not one time in the entire Civil War, gets injured. He's like this dude that just, just keeps on running. Uh, he eventually gets a name for himself in the Civil War. He fights in battles like Gettysburg. Uh, 
uh, and he uses that name to make money afterwards. Now, he's the type of, type of guy that's about himself. He's, he's about wearing perfumes, uh, keeping his golden locks uh, combed out, uh, wearing the finest shirts, velvet shirts. He gets pictures taken of himself, which are super expensive. But then he finds the love of his life, his wife, and he loves his wife so much that he actually abandons his troops when he's a commander after the Civil, after the Civil War. He abandons his troops just to go and spend like a weekend with his wife, which he loses pay for a year because of this. Uh, and anyway, he's eventually used to get rid of Native Americans in the West. Why? Because after the Civil War, the 13th Amendment goes away. And with the 13th Amendment gone, the I, or sorry, sorry, 13th Amendment makes slavery go away. And with slavery not an issue anymore, these territories in the West start opening up to new states because there's not the issue of is it going to be a slave, slave state or free state. And so they have to push the Native Americans off their land in order to make these new states and territories for, for up-and-coming settlers from America. So they send uh, Custer in to take out this guy named Sitting Bull. And Sitting Bull is this like really chill um, Native American uh, leader who literally there's an event where he's being shot at, and instead of freaking out, he like busts open a pipe and just starts smoking and basically rallies, rallies his Native American peoples to attack the, attack the Americans, and he wins. Well, he has the largest grouping of Native Americans at the time, and Custer goes to take them on, and it's in the Dakota region where they found gold. And what happens is uh, Custer is vastly outnumbered, like way outnumbered. Yet he has the ego that he's, he's the boss, and he eventually uh, loses. Basically, you have uh, three diff four different groups. You have one group protecting the base for Custer, one group attacking from the east, the other group attacking from the south, and he was going to attack from the north. The other two groups get uh, pushed away. Custer still goes in for the attack. He gets obliterated, like just massacred. Uh, and this basically is going to end up with Custer's last stand. And he gets his body gets desecrated. He's uh, stripped. Uh, he has needles pierced into his eardrums. Just horrible stuff happens to him. And it's kind of his ego doing it to him. It's called hubris. Sometimes you think you know more than what you do. So uh, when I come back, we're going to talk about Wounded Knee, and then we're going to talk about indoctrination. Wounded Knee Massacre. So this is dealing with the Sioux tribe. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about a couple of different people, the Sioux tribe, Bigfoot and uh, Yellow Bird. But uh, the Sioux tribe are decimated at this point. They're forced in reservations. And the reason why is because they sold bison. I'm sorry, they didn't just sell bison. They, they hunted bison to sell and also use for their livelihood. But um, the American government actually put a high price on bison to encourage people to kill off all the bison. And within like a few decades, almost all the bison are gone after this. And it basically decimates the lifestyle of the Sioux. So you have, um, you have Bigfoot, who is a, a, a tribe leader, who is moving the Sioux into a different location. Uh, and there's this new religious practice called ghost dance that starts taking place. It starts in the, the, like the Nevada territories, and it works its way up north. And the ghost dance was basically a religious belief and uh, uh, instruction that this dance was supposed to make the world better. It's basically to start anew. But the people of the Sioux are having it so bad. What it means by start anew is this ghost dance is supposed to eliminate the Americans. And it's literally just a ceremonial dance type of thing that they believe religiously is going to change the world. Well, anyway, the Americans see this as a threat. You have this religious cult, if you will, this religious belief that's going to take over and push them to fight against us. So they have to stop it. So what they do is uh, they send about a couple thousand troops uh, to put down the Sioux, uh, not to put down, but to basically monitor the Sioux's activities. And they end up in Wounded Knee, and it's cold. It's uh, even Bigfoot, their tribal leader, is suffering from pneumonia at the time. And uh, you have this other tribal member named Yellowbird who is trying to get his other troops, we should fight back, like literally saying this in front of the soldiers. And a scuffle takes place, a fight, and a gun goes off. Now, we don't know who, the, who shot the gun. But we know the outcome. The outcome of this is after this one gunshot takes place is that over 300 men, women, and children of the Sioux are massacred by the American soldiers, and uh, 20 of those American soldiers receive uh, medals of honor for it. Yeah, that's rough. So uh, I'm going to talk about a couple different terms here, assimilation and indoctrination. So assimilation is where somebody uh, charts to take on the traits uh, and characteristics of another culture. Uh, to just become part of that culture. Indoctrination is basically implanting belief systems into people um, so that stays for generation after generation. Here's what's happening. We're going to talk about the boarding schools for Native Americans. We're going to talk about uh, the indoctrination attempts of these Native Americans throughout time. 
So you're talking about 1879, uh, and you have this guy named Richard Pratt. Richard Pratt uh, took POWs, Native American POWs, and he basically did these experiments with them where to change their culture, uh, to get them to do certain things, to work, to act, to believe like that of the uh, American, the American belief, whatever that could be. And he shows this to the government. Look at I made these Native Americans who acted like this now are behaving more like this. So I want to do this for all the new generations of Native Americans. I want to set up schools to have Native Americans come in and I can teach them uh, American culture, indoctrinate them. Uh, and what happens is the government actually gives them this money, gives them tons of money to set up these schools. And what the schools goal, they, each school has a mission statement. You can actually look on schools' uh, websites to find their mission statement. The school's mission statement uh, said, kill the Indian and save the man, was their, was their mission statement, which implies that they're not men and that killing the Indian means killing their culture. And so children were forced to go to these schools. When I say forced, by the way, the parents could either let the kids go to these schools or the uh, parents could go to jail. Some of them were sent to Alcatraz. Uh, or they could, uh, you know, not be fed. And I'm not going to go through all of that, but basically after putting Native Americans reservations of land that you couldn't actually farm on, they were dependent on local governments to give them food. And that was basically a way to keep them from, from fighting because you, you, you can't, you can't, uh, you don't do what we say, we're not going to feed you. So uh, these children were taken. Uh, then they were changed, they changed their names. Uh, they changed their clothes, their haircuts. Uh, they gave them haircuts. Uh, they couldn't speak their old languages, and they were not allowed to speak to their families. So pretty much what characterizes kids, there are all those things, uh, and they were taken away. They were stripped away from these people. Uh, kids suffered physical, sexual, and psychological abuse while they are at these boarding schools, um, and they were indoctrinated to believe certain things uh, about the American culture uh, that were great and that their old culture was bad. What was really bad about this is when the, the students of these, these boarding schools would go home, uh, they weren't always accepted by their family members because sometimes they couldn't even speak to their family members because they lost the ability to speak in that language. Uh, they didn't act like them, and they were basically not wanted by any group. They didn't, weren't wanted by the American society. They were not wanted by their old cultural society. They are basically in this weird limbo of just psychological torture. So this goes on for a while, uh, these schools. And in like 1929, there's a report that starts talking about how bad these schools are. And you start seeing some schools start closing down. Now we'll, we'll talk about the photographs in class, but you'll see some of these, these schools like start closing down. And around the 1970s, you see a big push to, to get all the rest of these shut down. But you have to understand, you, you have like 20,000-ish students uh, were in these schools in the 1900, and it jumped to 60,000 in 1925. So it, they had a lot of people there. It's a lot of indoctrination that's going on, a lot of uh, retraining the brain and making them believe that their former lives were terrible and that their new lives were going to be better, which was a lie, too, because it, it wasn't. So after these schools getting shutting down, there's a second wave that takes place of indoctrination of uh, Native American children, and that has to do with adoption. So in the 1950s, the 1970s, there's a program uh, of trying to get uh, – uh, Americans to adopt Native American children and what's used by this is a standard of living that negates the cultural aspects of Native Americans. So you would have uh, social workers that would go in and say that kids were being neglected because there was too many people in the homes. But the problem is Native American culture back then allowed for extended families to live in the same house and they were being deducted, they were being marked off as doing something wrong because it didn't look like the average American. So it must be wrong if it's not the average American. And they would use these reasons to actually take children out of homes, um, and they would put them in foster homes and adoption agencies. And what happened was they were also very similar to the boarding schools, being stripped of their cultural uh, heritage, uh, and it caused a whole bunch of problems. You can actually look at some of the case studies of some of the kids that were alive during this. They're, they're telling the stories today. They suffer depression, suicidal thoughts, and some other things. So this is kind of like the uh, indoctrination and depletion of uh, the Native American culture over time in different periods of the United States. Uh, not fun, but this is kind of a review for everything. So I hope you didn't enjoy, but I hope you got something out of it.